NATO has started a massive air exercise over Germany. What is the message it is sending as the Ukraine war heats up? The top US securities regulator has launched a crackdown against cryptocurrency platforms in a move that can change the future of the crypto market. Italy's former Prime Minister and billionaire right-wing politician Silvio Berlusconi died on Monday. What is his legacy? Welcome to Daily Debrief. I'm your host Shriya and we take a look at these stories today. NATO began what it calls its largest ever air deployment over Europe in Germany. The Air Defender Exercise 2023 is set to involve 10,000 participants and 250 aircrafts from 25 countries, meant to demonstrate the strength and unity of the Western military alliance set against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine. What lies ahead? We ask Abdul Rahman, who joins us in studio. Welcome to the show, Abdul. So, first off, what is the objective behind this uh, air exercise by NATO? Well, there is an official version, of course, according to which this is uh, just an exercise. Of course, it is the largest ever, the unprecedented scale exercise and all. But it is prime not against any country. That's what the official NATO version is. But, uh, of course, if you see the, the place where it is happening, if you see the participation of the countries, the number of countries which are participa participating, and in the context in which it is happening, of course, is primarily to prepare the NATO countries, the Europe, Western European countries in particular, and their allies outside the, uh, that region, which includes uh, Japan, which is not even the member of NATO, and Sweden, which is one of the applicants, not yet accepted as full members. If you see all of it, it is primarily uh, targeted uh, at, at the Russians, uh, uh, given the fact that there is a war going on in Ukraine and NATO has been supporting the Ukrainian uh, uh, government, uh, providing armaments, providing other uh, support, including tanks and uh, aircrafts. So in that context, of course, it is basically getting ready for any eventuality. Uh, against uh, Russia, uh, that is the primary objective. If you see this exercise is happening along with a naval exercise in the Baltics, uh, again NATO countries, there are 25 countries are participating here, 19 countries are participating there and there is a quite overlap uh, uh, in terms of the number of countries participating and uh, this basically fits into the larger scheme. Uh, if you see NATO's statements in recent months, they have identified China and uh, Russia as the primary threats uh, to their quote-unquote collective security and uh, uh, the deployment of forces on the ground on the borders with Russia has, has increased and there have been a number of exercises carried by NATO countries have also increased. So this is part of that larger uh, uh, context. Right, Abdul. I mean, there is surely no need for reading between the lines here because exactly. even in the official version, they say that it's designed to be defensive. True. So, the context of this thing is very important. So, how do you see the war in Ukraine shaping up from here? Well, that is the central issue. If you see uh, NATO members and particularly the US uh, have have been responsible for what is happening in Ukraine. And that is an obvious fact. Uh, they basically created an atmosphere in which Russia, despite raising objections time and again, that expansion of NATO to a its world, east, eastward expansion of NATO mm. is basically against the national security of Russians. And instead of um, pushing for that, NATO countries should basically stop their expansion and provide uh, Russia some kind of security guarantee um, and so on and so forth. That was the primary demand uh, apart from the what is happening in Donetsk and in other uh, Russian speaking regions in Ukraine. Uh, these were the primary concerns which basically led to Russia basically starting the quote unquote special military operation uh, in Ukraine last year. Um, but NATO did not address those concerns and instead, uh, ever, ever since the war has started, instead of finding ways to kind of resolve the conflict uh, through dialogue and uh, reconciliation, what we see that there is an ag attempted uh, uh, move to basically escalate the war. So, uh, 
from a time when the US and the European countries, Western European countries, uh, claiming that providing aircrafts will create escalation and so on to Ukraine, they have provided that. Uh, they have admitted Finland uh, and uh, uh, now Sweden mm. are, are, is on the verge of being admitted to NATO. So expansion is ha happening. There are greater talks about Ukrainians being inducted into NATO formally. That all of this, if you see that it seems that this is a part of the larger geopolitical uh, move which is happening vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the insecurities, growing insecurities of the NATO countries, particularly the leadership. Uh, of uh, NATO US and vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia and China uh, in, many, in many ways, which basically is pushing uh, such kind of aggressive uh, uh, behavior. And it is also, you can, you can say it's a kind of a defensive move in a sense that they do not want uh, any challenge to their military dominance in the global politics. NATO uh, was considered to be, uh, when it was initially formed, at least theoretically it was a defensive alliance, but everyone knows that it is not a defensive alliance. It has been used uh, during the Cold War against uh, Soviet Union uh, for initial five decades uh, against Soviet Union, and now it is increasingly being used to basically reinforce the uh, military hegemony and the dominance of US and its Western European allies. So whether it is the war in Iraq, whether it is war in Afghanistan, whether it is war in Libya uh, and in, uh, in Yugoslavia, in different other places, NATO has been uh, uh, an aggressor and it is not a defensive alliance. So we should see it in that particular context in which this particular exercise and is happening. If you see one last thing I think uh, needs to mention that US also uh, because it is feeling the uh, rise of China economically, militarily as well, uh, it basically is trying to, uh, 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 it is difficult of course, the, uh, the overall defense budget is almost $8 trillion, which is one of the, high, the highest in the world. If you include all 10 countries defense budgets, that will be still less than what US spends alone. Uh, despite that, it is not uh, satisfied with this uh, amount of uh, more than 100, 800 bases all across the world, so much expenditure being the leaders, leading, leader, leading country in the arm exports and everything. It wants the NATO countries, member countries, 31 member countries to also share the burden of defense. It means everyone, every country is expected to increase their defense uh, expenditure. So increased defense expenditure. Uh, uh, greater deployment of troops on the eastern, uh, on the western border of uh, Russia, uh, greater expansion of NATO towards uh, Russia, and uh, 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 other uh, initiatives taken by NATO. All of this basically leads to the conclusion that there is a growing uh, uh, fear of uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, challenge to their dominance in the global. Um, uh, global security uh, arena. Right. So, overall, it's a push for a around the globe militarization of exactly. sorts. Exactly. Yeah. When the, the, the hegemons become insecure, yeah. uh, this always leads to uh, uh, increased armament, uh, increased confrontation, and uh, greater emphasis on security and military expenditure, which means. There are 31 members in NATO, apart from that, Japan is going to uh, join it uh, or there is a, a talk about it, there is all a part of the military exercise already. If you include all of it, it of course, there is a push, greater push for larger uh, uh, armament uh, in the world and that means greater conflicts. If there are non real conflicts, there are can, conflicts will be invented just like what we see, we have seen in last one year at least. Thank you so much for that update, Abdul. We'll be following the war in Ukraine with you and with People's Dispatch. Thanks for joining us. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, also known as SEC, has sued two major crypto exchange platforms, namely Coinbase and Binance, in what looks like a crackdown against the crypto industry. At the heart of these lawsuits is the question of whether crypto can be considered securities and be regulated by the SEC. 
So far, no crypto platform operates as a full-blown stock exchange. The SEC also this year sued Bixi Digital and Bittrex Incorporated for failing to register as an exchange. We go now to Bapa Sinha for more questions on this issue. Welcome to the show, Bapada. So, first off, uh, what's happening? Uh, how do we understand these back-to-back -back lawsuits? Right. So, um, what SEC has done is uh, charge both um, Binance and uh, Coinbase, the two largest crypto exchanges, uh, with securities violations. So, so um, this is a change in position, right? For the longest time, uh, there were many people who were wondering why cryptocurrencies were being uh, not categorized as securities and then come under securities laws. But finally, SSE seems to have woken up and uh, uh, categorized uh, cryptocurrencies as securities and then um, uh, sued these two companies for illegally trading securities, right? Without uh, basically trading securities without um, registering with the SEC. Uh, so this is um, finally the government waking up and uh, trying to regulate uh, the wild west of cryptocurrencies after pretty much after the the most of the fraud has already yeah. happened but um, uh, they have done that also uh, the SSC chairman has um, made a comment that uh, other the the so called the all coins, right? Well, the statement he made was that we don't need any more cryptocurrencies, right? Uh, and what the market is interpreting that as, as the all coins, right? The okay. the mm -hmm. coins other than Bitcoin, the um, the main coins are Bitcoin and Ethereum. So the coins other than them uh, would likely face even more um, harsher regulations. Uh, regulations from the government. And uh, so the coins like uh, Solana and Cardano. And um, there is another coin so which have taken a fairly large hit in the last week um, following the, the the announcement by SEC. So, and uh, I mean, uh, there's a lot of talk about how this is likely to uh, shape the future of the crypto market because, like you mentioned, there's a change in the stance whether these are securities or not. So, what's your take on that? See, I think the if this this had happened, for example, last year, it would have been a much bigger news, right? Because the the crypto market kind of peaked at the end of 2021, and uh, through the last year, we saw some of the major crashes. Um, frankly, I think like in 2023, the, the at least the mainstream mar uh, the, the mainstream media and people in the mainstream, they seem to have lost interest in crypto after, crypt, after like, let's say, Bitcoin collapsed from something like uh, 65,000 to around 20,000. Hmm. So the, the general public's interest in crypto seems to have just dissipated, right? And um, uh, after a series of fraud revelations which happened and many of the crypto coins um, collapsed, uh, and it kind of culminated with the bankruptcy of FTX. Um, the the space has kind of been given up, I think, by the general public. There are still some crypto diehards who continue to hold and trade crypto, but uh, so um, so these actions are kind of seem to be more like uh, window dressing, right? After the like proverbial horses left the barn. That's what seems to have happened. But finally, the government has woken up, and uh, uh, it. Um, we can only speculate, but it appears if uh, the, um, these um, court cases are resolved in the SEC's favor, then uh, the the trading of cryptocurrencies through these uh, through these exchanges will pretty much be uh, banned, right? Uh, right, Papada. So you mentioned how uh, at this point of time the crypto may not be so much of an interest for the audience. But uh, can you tell us a little more about what happened last year? So, see, the thing is, the, um, the kind of Bitcoin, which is kind of the, the, the grandfather of the entire crypto market, that got uh, created, um, I think, sometime in 2007, 2008. And basically, at that point, uh, with the global financial crisis and, and the kind of loss of faith in the banking system, uh, there was a, 
feeling in the people that you needed a coin which was outside of the banking system. You need currency outside of the banking system. And there have been many ups and downs in the market. The market really went crazy in around uh, the time when the pandemic hit and um, when there was um, a rise across the board of risk assets and, and crypto just went crazy in that time, right? Like many of these coins went um, like 50 times, 100 times, 1000 times from that time frame between, let's say, beginning of 2000 to middle to end of 2021. Uh, this was also the time of the ultra loose uh, monetary policy. Interest rates were at zero. The Fed was cutting rates. Uh, quantitative easing was happening. Now, when that regime got reversed, right, and the Fed started raising interest rates, quantitative tightening starts started happening, and the risk assets in general started um, falling. Uh, crypto, being the riskiest of all these assets, uh, basically took a huge hit, right, and and kind of all the predictions that this was the future of currency and the future of digital currency and and they were calling it web 3.0 uh, future of web 3.0 all that has come crashing down right and what we have discovered is it's pretty much a field for scamsters and ponzi schemes and like most ponzi schemes they are also started to collapse so um, it may survive in some form uh, as a speculative asset but i think the 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 predictions which were made that this was the future of web and this was the future of currency, I think that is pretty much gone, right? And uh, I don't think anybody has illusions about those anymore. Right. Thank you so much for joining us today, Papada. Silvio Berlusconi, Italy's former prime minister and billionaire right-wing politician, died in Milan on June 12th at the age of 86. In a decades-long career marred by financial and other scandals and prosecutions, the leader of the Forza Italia party would assume the role of prime minister four times between 1994 and until he was forced to step down in 2011. He was also known for his platforming of the far-right and neoliberal anti-worker policies. We, to we talk about the man and his life in politics with Prashant. Thanks for joining us, Prashant. So, Berlusconi, he has had a very interesting career in the sense uh, when we talk about especially his politics of platforming the right. Uh, can you quickly take us through uh, this whole career of his which has spanned decades? Right, I think there are two or three things which we need to be very clear about Silvio Berlusconi in the sense that I think when a lot of obits are written nowadays, especially of important politicians, often, you know, <clears throat> it's there's a lot of, oh, oh but he was also, he, there was also this great legacy, or oh, this is interesting, etc. But we need to also often see what impact politicians like Berlusconi had on Italy, which was that his uh, ascent from 1994 onwards, and even when he was not in power, it marked a consistent rise of right-wing politics and a very concerted attack on leftist and progressive politics throughout those two or three decades. So that, if you if you ask in one sentence what was Berlusconi's legacy, that's precisely it. Like you said, the platforming, you know, when, again, platforming is a word which sort of uh, seems a bit, uh, <laughs> let's be, it, it's more clear to say that basically he allied with the descendants or the successors of basic of Italian fascism. And today, if that party, uh, the descendants of Italian fascism under Giorgio Meloni and are in power, a key reason is the fact that Berlusconi, who was more of a mainstream political force, actually provided uh, cover for them. And it's not only Giorgio Meloni and her party, it's also the League party of Matteo Salvini, again, a very virulent right-wing party, again, also got, uh, you know, was, it was, was part of those alliances, those combinations, which in the last decade, it's the 20th century, in the first decade, the 21st century, really gained legitimacy. And if you look at, for instance, his policies as well, uh, you know, I think we have a, re a report in People's Dispatch which chronicles some of that from some of our sources in Italy who talk about how there was a, there was a clear targeting of bills of provisions, for instance, which provided security to workers. There was a very concerted attempt made over time to sort of frac uh, fracture the working class through various kinds of new laws that came, that came up, for instance. So all this, you know, is part of very, very much part of what you would call the neoliberal framework, which many countries adopted. But Berlusconi also, you know, accelerated it, uh, gave cover to the left, like I said. And also, I think very important to note that 
uh, there was this crisis in Italy in the early 90s, which discredited a lot of the erstwhile political parties, both at the centre and the left. And Berlusconi was one of those people who came to the scene saying that he was an alternative. But the alternative he projected was very celebratory, celebratory driven, uh, you know, uh, alternative. It was one very much focused on himself and it was one which sort of made politics into a spectacle. Right, and automatically went against, or basically it said that okay, some politicians were corrupt, therefore everything they represented, all the values of fighting against fascism, of uh, you know, of the welfare state, for instance, all of these are out to be junked as well. That was pretty much his line, and the focus was, uh, you know, that that was basically became his focus. So I think his career is kind of a microcosm of what, hmm. uh, you know, what happened to Italy over the past decades. Uh, right, Prashant. So, uh, how do we see the Italy of today, uh, its politics, its economics, as a product of his career? So that's a very good question because uh, Italy is one of those countries today which is, uh, you know, it's in a pretty bad shape to put it very lightly. The workers, for instance, have seen their salaries either remain stagnant or decline for decades right now. And, uh, you know, it's, Italy is one of those countries which has been run often by very technocratic governments, uh, say people who were you know, IMF bureaucrats or World Bank bureaucrats and there's been a lot of focus on that. There's been a whole discrediting of the political class and one reason for that has also been uh, Berlusconi because he's faced so many uh, charges and the number, the huge number of political cases against him, cases of corruption, cases, not political cases, financial cases, cases of corruption, cases of fraud, etc, etc. So all these charges have also contributed to a very anti-political climate in the country. Uh, and which has also been increased by the fact that he has sort of made himself the story throughout. <clears throat> Politicians like Berlusconi, for that matter, Trump, or you know, say for the, even for that Modi, who make themselves the center of all politics, automatically also often create a very anti-political, uh, you know, sentiment. And at that point, people are like, okay, we need technocrats. And what do these technocrats bring? These technocrats bring with them policies which basically destroy. Mm -hmm. uh, the welfare net that governments provide. These politicians bring, uh, you know, steps which uh, cut, uh, you know, which increase taxes, for instance. Uh, sorry, cut taxes for companies, which increase taxes on people. These politicians bring policies which prevent any more hiring. Uh, you know, all these policies are very much part of the technocrat playbook. So, when we look at the poor economic situation is, uh, Italy is in, when we look at the fact that uh, a descendant of the fascists is in power in Italy today, all of this, like I said, is a result of these decades of Berlusconi's policy. So I think it's, uh, you know, when we read the orbits, when we read of him as a versatile political player, which is how many characterize him. And, you know, internationally, he had his moments. Let's be clear about that. But I think it's also important to remember that uh, this, this part of his legacy is very, very central. Thank you for joining us today, Prashant. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories, keep watching peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.